are with Jeff Dyer, who um, is a dear friend now, I think I can say, with pride and humility. <laughs> um, and his latest book is The Street Philosophy of Gary Winogrand. And for all the ignorant people out there who don't know who Gary Winogrand is, can you just give us a brief uh, oh, yeah. I introduction? Thought gonna, I thought you were going to say, for all the ignorant people out there who don't know who Jeff Dyer is. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of those people. Um, well, Gary Winogrand, you know, even though he didn't like the term street photographer, I think he's pretty widely regarded as one of the great street photographers um, who documented, uh, you know, mainly America throughout the 1960s and the 1970s and ended his life here where we are in Los Angeles. So one of the sort of serendipitous things about this, we're just up the road from Venice Beach, the, the, the boardwalk, where where he took quite a lot of the pictures. The, one of the very last pictures in the book is on uh, down on, on Venice Beach where he's filming a kind of escapologist trying to get out of, out of a straight jacket. Um, yeah, so Winogrand ended up here. And you've ended up here, <laughs> interestingly. I mean, it's probably the least, one of the least literate metropolises <laughs> in the world. No, I mean, it's not known for people reading much or writing much. I think, I, I, I remember talking to, um, um, uh, I'm spacing on his name, but the editor, the famous editor of, of Vanity Fair for so many years. Oh, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Um, anyway, he said, I couldn't ever live in L.A. because I can't finish a book there. And he meant reading one, not <laughs> writing one. Uh, <laughs> there seems to be something about the city that kind of, even people who read elsewhere have trouble reading here. And there's something that's kind of nurtures image making maybe more than, more than sure the, the, the word. You think but I think there's like? a very simple reason uh, why uh, people read less here. Uh, and it's to do with the single greatest defect of Los Angeles, which is why I will always be in a basically uh, hostile relationship to it, the, the, the lack of public transport. You know, I think it'll, the, one of the reasons that those Victorian, th those novels got so big in the 19th century was because people could sit on trains and, and read them. And, you know, people, whenever you're in London or New York, Berlin, one of these cities where, you know, it's actually crazy to drive, uh, people are reading these, they might be sitting on the tube physically, but in their heads, they're somewhere else. They're in, <clears throat> you know, even if they're still in London in their heads, very often they're in Dickens's London. So the fact that people are driving <clears throat> really eats into people's reading time, although I think that might now be changing as people here read, they consume a lot of books uh, in the form of audio books. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think people, you know, books are getting read a lot here, but quite often they're being read by people in the industry who are always looking uh, like sort of currency traders. They're looking at them to see if they can be converted into this other form of uh, content, you know, i.e. to be converted into films or series, that kind of stuff. So yeah, your work and thought uh, intersects with something I think a lot about, which is you know, I studied philosophy, you have the word philosophy in the title here. Um, you know, as I, I'm, I'm also a photographer and a filmmaker, and uh, I, I find writing, like many writers also do, a, a torturous process. Um, oh, yeah. well, I hate it too. <laughs> there's, so, so there's like, I, and, 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 and Winogrand, it seems, had the, the opposite. He loved being behind the camera. He said he lost himself. Uh, you know, he ceased to exist when he was behind the camera. He was really like so immersed in the process and, and he thought that that was the greatest thing we could strive for was not existing, right? Uh, or, or I think and that's, it goes back to Heidegger too, the idea of like just being in the flow or in, 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 in the process. So I'm very curious, your attraction to the, to the, the, the image and why, what does the, the written word bring to that? Does it take you out of the torture of the written <laughs> word to, uh, to like attach yourself to images and think about them? Or? Well, there's lots to unpack here. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, let's go lot. back to one of the first points you made. You're absolutely right that for, you know, what did Winogrand like doing? He liked photographing. Uh, and there's quite a, there's quite a long history of, uh, in photography of people who, at some age, they, somebody gives them a camera 
or they come and discover this thing that they just love doing. You know, Edward Weston, you know, he starts, one, as soon as he, he, you know, it's like love at first sight. They get a hold of a camera, they start loving figuring it out. And same with Winograd, you know, obviously he wasn't really, uh, he didn't go to a, I mean, his way of learning about photography was to go out and do it. So there's, there's that, yeah, the, the, the camera as a kind of thing that gives you your identity and people just love it and that's it. For the rest of their lives, that's what they want to do. Hence the great pathos, I think, of that line towards the end of her life, where after one of Diane Arbus's breakdowns, when in her diaries she says something like, you know, I walked around the other day with a camera around my neck just so I could feel like a photographer again. So I like this idea that the camera becomes your identity. Lee Friedlander, for example, you know, when I got this, uh, I was at some prize giving thing and Lee Friedlander was being honored with, I think, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he spent the whole evening at this very glamorous ceremony in uh, New York photographing, as though he was some, as though he just got, as a sort of 20 year old, he just got the prize for, you know, next upcoming whippersnapper or something, you know, so that's, anyway, so people like photographing. It's very similar when, with the guitar, you know, that can become the thing that transforms somebody's life. And I always contrast this thing, the, the life of a musician with that of a writer, you know, a musician wakes up in the morning and what the musician wants to do is make music, yeah. you know. What do you do when you're a writer? You wake up, well, you know, you make some orange juice, you make some coffee, have a bowl of cereal, then you maybe think, I need another coffee, all the time, because there's this thing that you're meant to be doing, which you're dreading, and eventually the moment comes when you can't put it off any longer, and it's pretty miserable, and then after a certain amount of time, you get into it. But it's this, you know, that famous Thomas Mann line, you know, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. There's a few writers who wake up in the morning and they really look forward to writing, but there is a component of dread to it. So that's the one distinction. Do you think that's in part because, like a musician, I mean, obviously there's improvisation and, you're, and there's writing new material, but there's a certain, like, rehearsed, there's a wonderfulness about playing something that you already know how to play, that you've played a thousand times before. Whereas the writer, every sentence is by its very nature new yeah, so and that, unrehearsed and therefore, you know, ha doesn't have that ease of emerging, maybe. Well, that's, you know, it's quite a common, I mean, to, again, to pick up with several things you've said, the key word in that is playing, you know, uh, you're playing music. And of course, everyone likes playing, you know, every, from the first from when you're a kid, what do you like doing? You like playing. Writing, unfortunately, there's no playing involved. It's just writing with all the concentration that involves. And it's not at all unusual for writers to say, I don't write, I rewrite. So what we like is when there is something there, then we, so I really love revising, but that yeah. first kind of draft is, is incredibly painful. Partly because there isn't much, yeah, anyway, so there's, there's that as well, I think. And, and people, so people historically have been kind of uh, dismissive about photography even being an art because, I mean, the whole nature of technology, again, going back to Heidegger, is that it takes away the need for skillfulness, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that uh, I kind of delve into in my film Being in the World is that uh, the, the promise of technology is to remove the need for the skilled engagement. So like you listen to a record so that you don't have to learn how to play a musical instrument, but it makes you this kind of passive, mm -hmm. insignificant uh, consumer of things versus like being an active, actively engaged with your community. And, and so there's a, there's a real threat of meaninglessness in that state. And I think that, you know, if you even read like, you know, Gore Vidal, I remember saying, well, how can you possibly call photography a art form? You're just clicking a button, mm -hmm. you know? And, and yet people do tend to take a passive thing and turn it into an active and creative thing. So, you know, the record player was made to just sit back and listen to music, but then there's DJs who like take that to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular moment that you think like photography became a serious art form? Was uh, Winogrand part of that history? Well, again, there's a, a lot to unpack. Yeah, I'm here. sorry. This, I is like, <laughs> this is turning into a sort of a Tristram Shandy-like uh, interview that we have to regress uh, so much. But, you know, yeah, right from the start, I think even Fox Talbot was saying, you know, okay, I can't, you know, 
can't, you know, can't, can't draw, but the, the camera, the, you know, the pench, uh, creating visual images was the preserve exclusively of people who had considerable technical skill. The camera meant that it was something that sort of, you know, anybody could do. But then we get into this very interesting thing. I mean, it, I mean, the, the heart of one of the really fascinating things about photography is the way that you give a camera to um, a whole bunch of different people. And although they might be recording the same scene, quite often you can actually uh, think, oh, you know, actually I can, I can deduce the identity of the photographer from the way that they've, uh, you know, uh, from the kind of things they're drawn to, and even more interestingly, from the way that they've photographed a particular scene. Now, that's not always the case because there are certain instances where you can think of a, a, a photograph, particularly it's, you know, war photography, let's say, when the interest of the picture is entirely in what it documents and that kind of authorial signature is much less important. But I think with somebody like Winogrand, you know, you, um, uh, you show somebody a picture and you can say, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's a Winogrand. And interestingly, even if it turns out, oh, it's not by Winogrand, it's by somebody who has, who has absorbed the Winogrand uh, way of proceeding and aesthetics. But, you know, Winogrand himself, is so, it's not for nothing that the book is called The Street Philosophy of Gary Winogrand, because I think he said these amazingly deep philosophical things about, uh, uh, about photography, even though he said them in a way that was the exact opposite of academic. So, you know, when he says, I think really brilliantly, you know, the thing is, you know, if you photograph in Texas, your pictures are going to look like Texas. That seems to say something very profound about photography. How so? Well, Unpack because that for us. <laughs> it doesn't bear unpacking. It's like I remember when somebody, when I quoted the line of Nietzsche's, you know, the thought of suicide has got me through many a bad night. And somebody said, well, what does he mean by that? What he means by it is the thought of suicide has got too many a bad night. <laughs> but it's, yeah, so when Winogrand is photographing in Texas, they, you know, the pictures look like Texas. But the point is, they also don't just look like Texas. They look like Winogrand's Texas. That's, that's why I'm surprised that you pulled that quote. Of the things I read, it seemed that he was um, always saying it wasn't about what was in front of the camera. It was like he was photographing to see what the photograph looked like. Mm -hmm. Or uh, one of the things that struck me was he said uh, the picture, and, and, and I can actually get to what was going to be my first question <laughs> that we're just kind of in a prelude to. Um, he said there's no narrative in his pictures, no. that, that the only narrative is what like does light do to a mm -hmm. photographic uh, negative, right? Or to, hold on, I wrote it down because I thought it was so important. He said, photos have no narrative content, they merely describe light on paper. Yeah. So that's a kind of very modernist uh, statement, much different from what you said about it being about Texas. Well, well, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, so it's one person, Winogrand, saying all of these things. So he says on the one hand, which is irrefutable, that uh, unless you were some, unless you wanted to get deep into some sort of philosophical sophistry, you know, if you photograph in Texas, it's going to look like Texas. But then he also insists that your, the, photo, the photograph is not Texas. It's a depiction of photograph. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. A depiction. A photograph is not the thing in it. It's a depiction of things. Right. And then he says all these other, all you know, there's all sort of variants on that. That where he says, you know, and I quote this in the chapter about in the, one of the sections about photographing women. Because on the one hand, you know, he says, you know, sure, I like, you know, whenever I see an attractive woman, I want to photograph her. So there he is. That's the most basic lecherous impulse at work. The impulse that got him into a lot of trouble when the book Women Are Beautiful came out. On the other hand, he says, the thing is to make, uh, the, 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 the interesting thing about photography is to make a photograph that's more beautiful than the thing or the person in it. So then it gets, you know, more, more, in, more, more interesting still. Uh, and then after that, it's the idea that when he's taking the photograph, he doesn't know exactly what the result is going to be. Hence his most famous line that he photographs to find out what a thing looks like photographed. So this gets us to our first question, <laughs> which is what I'm okay, trying to get to along, yeah. but we need all this in order to do this. The way you've, you've done this book, and there's a hundred photographs here, 
and each photo is accompanied by an essay that you've written. And so what I'm so curious about is why? You know, why, what does the written word bring to the image? What is your hope? Um, and, and, and is there, a, is there an, a, an obverse relationship like of, does the photo bring something to your words? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just to give a bit more background then, I mean, when I read that uh, uh, Sarkowski book on Atjeh, I mean, I just loved it as a book in its own right. Uh, the, the, the writing was extremely interesting and I just loved the form. I thought it was something so simple, so beautiful. And then for ages, I thought I wanted to do my version of that book. And that's, that's not uncommon, I think, you know. But I just couldn't think of anyone to do it about. Uh, and then in, a, in this interview with Aperture magazine, with, uh, it was printed in, in Aperture, it was me and Janet Malcolm talking about photography. You know, I said something like, I hope I don't go to my grave without having done a book in that form myself. And then when I was teaching down in Texas, uh, I had lunch with a guy who runs the University of Texas Press for whom I'd written a, an introduction to a book about the, the Magnum Archive. And he said, you know, I know what your next book's going to be. And I didn't. And then he said that he'd got permission from the, uh, uh, from the um, uh, Center for Creative Photography in Tucson where Winogrand's archive is. It's a vast archive. You know, it, had to be in, it had to be in Arizona. You needed a big place for all this stuff. Uh, he got permission for, to use 100 pictures to do a book exactly like the one I, I'd imagined. He said, what are, was I interested in doing it? And the moment he said it, I thought, oh my God, this is just, of course, you know, of course Winogrand is the perfect subject because I'd written about him quite a bit in the ongoing moment. But I always wanted to see more Winogrand. So it was the perfect thing to follow on from what Winogrand always said, which, which was that he took, he was a photographer as a way of, educating himself in photography. So this was a great chance to further educate myself about Gary Winogrand. So that's the sort of deep background to it. And then I guess following up from that line of his that I'd quoted earlier, you know, we said, when he says the tricky thing is to uh, take a photograph that's more beautiful or more interesting than the things in it, part of the challenge of this is that on occasions, you know, maybe I could write something about the photographs that were that was more interesting than the photographs themselves or that made the photographs more interesting than they first appeared to the reader or lest that sound arrogant i could perhaps articulate for myself and in doing so articulate for the reader why it is that some of these very weird seeming pictures are incredibly interesting and uh you know it's uh uh, it's, it's obviously it's a dialogue between word and image um, and um, sometimes uh, what I'm doing is telling the, the kind of telling the story that lies within the photograph so actually that means I need to go back to one of the first things you said you know Winogrand's line that a photo photograph has no narrative ability right and he gives various examples of that I think he says at one you know one picture you can't tell whether the guy's putting a hat on his head or taking it off and he says you know you can't tell whether this woman is pulling her panties up or down you know he's talking there about an individual photograph but the thing is that's you know that's an interesting provocative thing but the fact that a, a photograph has no narrative ability only enhances our sense of its narrative potential and of course once you talk about narrative potential then you're talking about what's going on maybe in the seconds after the split second that the picture was taken or the split or the few seconds before or alternatively what's happening to the right or the left of the frame uh, and of course once you're talking about that then of course that becomes very very interesting from the point of view of storytelling which of course writers like doing very much so, to sum up, the lack of the narrative ability is what gives the picture its great narrative potential, and then as a writer you, you, you exploit that. Because, yeah, you, you lead perfectly into what I was going to ask next, which is, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a stillness, obviously, there's an atemporality about a, an image in theory, right? It's like, or, you know, there's this one, you, you, you note somewhere in the book, it's like one two hundred fiftieth of a yeah. second is... Mm -hmm. 
a typical time that a daylight shot might be taken in. And, and Winogrand talks about he's just putting you know, a frame around uh, a, a reality, right? Mm -hmm. But you help us to look before and after that time and outside of the frame. And, and you, in a way, you add a temporal element mm -hmm. to the image by describing in this way. And also the time. Yesterday, you were showing me a photography book and, and I was flipping through it too quickly. And you told me you should, I should linger on the images more. <laughs> And I joked that it reminded me of that line in When Harry Met Sally when he said, I have to, every time I sleep with a woman, I'm laying there wondering how long I have to lay there before <laughs> I, I'm allowed to get up. Yes, and, yeah. and, and so I was very self-conscious about how long I had to look at each image without you, you know, the wrath of your judgment there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but you, in a much less, more subtle and interesting way, you have forced me to look at these images by mm. writing about them. And I, it's really interesting to look at the image once, you know, without your insights, let's say, and, and then read and then look at it again and go back and forth. And, and really, you're teaching us to see in a way, right? Our, and, mm. and he wants to do that too, right? He talks about like wanting to sh uh, show us how to look, I think I saw. Yeah, that's right. So he takes the picture and then, you know, he says he photographs to find out what's in the what a thing looks like photograph. So then he, when he sees the, the picture in the contact sheets, all this kind of stuff, he's maybe spotting stuff in there that you know he what didn't know for sure was there. So that's that interesting thing of discovery. Then I see the picture and maybe I'll note stuff that he didn't see. And then of course it doesn't stop there, this kind of ping pong, because the reader in turn will uh, spot the, will, will both uh, see things in the picture as a, as a result of my pointing, but the reader might also uh, spot things that I haven't seen myself. And there's also the possibility, and my God, I've encountered this in the talks I've done about uh, the book, where the read, uh, some, some people, uh, you know, they've heard me describe the pictures and they really, to an extent that surprised me, they've really taken offence at it. They've really just been, the, the hostility to some of the things has been really uh, uh, remarkable. To your descriptions? Yeah, and my whole approach. You know, at the very first talk I did at the Getty, it was really, it was, uh, yeah, it went really well, I thought. And then uh, uh, I was going out for dinner with one of the women attached to the, to the Getty. And on the car to the restaurant, she said, oh, I, really, I disagreed with what you were saying. And I said, oh, about which picture? And she sort of said, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, so, so this actually leads perfectly also to something I wanted to talk about that's delicate in this day and age. You know, there's, there is this kind of voyeuristic objectification that happens and this, you know, this male gaze, here we are two men uh, talking about another guy who went around and taking pictures of women, calling one of them women, one of the books, you know, unsubtly, women are beautiful. And, but there's something about the nature of photography, I think it just occurred to me that in French, the word for lens is objectif, right? Oh. So we are objectifying, we are bo being voyeuristic when we take pictures. Uh, there is a delight in the surface, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Nietzsche always talked about like, we should uh, delight in the surface of things, right? Um, so to what extent should we deny that and should we embrace that being sensitive to today's like political yeah. and you know yeah. gender yeah. dynamics and stuff like that? Sure. Well, it's on the one hand, you know, it's we might as well just sort of say guilty as charged because uh, you know, okay, he wasn't quite as much of a perv as Miroslav Tiki with his homemade camera with its you know long lens made out of a rusty old baked bean tin or whatever he was doing as he lechered around the swimming pools uh, of his of his hometown but yeah he is he's just sort of perving around new york in a way i think it's really the most unfortunate thing about that body of work collected in the book women are beautiful is the title because actually on the one hand there's a great bit in the documentary about uh, Winogrand where um, someone says you know he's there photographing this time of great political turbulence and he's photographing these women on their sort of women's lib marches or anti-Vietnam marches and what's he on the other hand uh, what it seems to me that what most interests and attracts Winogrand about women and you can see this I think it's one of the things I bring out in the sequencing He's attracted to women who display so many of the qualities that were unleashed or liberated by the women's movement. So it's this kind of thing of independence, power, 
um, you know, not being meek, you know, and it's, it, it, you know, it really loves photographing these, there's these so many moments when there's a sort of woman glaring at him saying, fuck you, and of course he, he sort of loves that. Right. So it's a kind of, weird, it's, it's, but it's also, among other things, I think, a celebration of the, of the, of the kind of, uh, of, of the, the moment of women's, women's liberation. Right from a quite early stage in my becoming interested in photography, I was struck by this thing of, uh, um, you know, what was going on just beyond the frame. And, you know, all this idea that the moment that a photograph, that in really great photographs, the, the, the moment of that photograph extends so much beyond the 250th of a second. Yeah. And I guess I got that idea from John Berger, to whom this book is dedicated and for whom it was intended as a, as, a, as a birthday present, although he passed away before the book came out. But, you know, okay, so I've been very, really informed and influenced by Berger, who was really great at bringing out the latent stories in, in photographs. And one of the early things I wrote about a photograph is that famous, beautiful photograph by Robert Kappa, which I'm sure you know of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> His favourite thing to say. <laughs> I think it's actually less patronising to say that than to assume that uh, you can't know it. But it's, it's that picture, it's in the Italian countryside, and it's this uh, soldier walking along with... Uh, and you can see them from behind walking along with this woman who's pushing a, pushing a bike, and it's this beautiful, romantic picture. And it just so... I mean, there it is, they're, they're walking along a road, and of course, as soon as you've got a road and a bicycle and they're moving along it, you've got inherent narrative interest. Yeah. So you want to tell their story, and in, uh, when I first wrote about that picture, I duly told the romantic story. Uh, and then I saw, uh, uh, another, uh, saw, saw the same picture with a different caption, and the caption said something like, Italian prisoner of war... Uh, um, um, uh, has fallen behind the rest of the column of prisoners of war. So on the one, okay. we'll uh, so it's not the romantic image that uh, that we've uh, you know that I'd assumed. On the other hand, it's a fantastically misleading caption because it doesn't mention the woman, mm -hmm. and she's the person that gives the photograph its its magic. So I think this is an interesting thing. On the one hand, you know, I think it was Walter Benjamin who said that you know uh, that the caption is going to become as important as, as the photograph and so often when it comes to uh, you know straight down the line documentary photography we need the contextualizing information provided by the caption yeah because otherwise you don't know you know what the person who's crying is a victim of and all, all this kind of stuff and on the other hand though you know what the photographer chooses to exclude. So in that case, Kappa excludes exactly the thing that is referred to in the caption, i.e. the column of POWs. So there's a picture in the Winograd book, famous picture, which was actually on the cover of Women Are Beautiful, of that woman with the ice cream cone, mm -hmm. laughing away like mad. And I sort of say, you know, why is she laughing? Could it be that she's just so happy about, you know, being photographed by, by Winograd? Uh, and then I point out that actually if we look at some of the contact sheets, we can see that the reason she was laughing was that, oh, the God, there he is, the boyfriend, you know. So she's happy because she's having a nice day out in sunny New York with her boyfriend. But she's then I... laughing despite when I go and Yeah, you know, and yeah. then it turns out actually, but you can say, but that evidence is inadmissible because it lies outside the, uh, you know, the published picture excludes the, the boyfriend, he's not there, but Winogrand is, he's there, he's literally there, reflected in the shop window. So it's, it is just him and the woman. And one of the great things about, uh, I mean, Winogrand, you're always learning more about him. So somebody who came to one of my talks told me about that picture and said it was one of the rare instances where Winogrand hadn't just taken the picture, he'd actually had some sort of dealings with the woman and had seen her with her boyfriend and then had said, you know, sort of chatted to her and then had encouraged or coaxed the laugh from her. So it's, it's as near as Winogrand ever got to a, a staged picture, although very often what we, what we see happening is Winogrand, his presence there sort of causes 
uh, incites a picture to come into existence because one of the elements that makes a given picture interesting, gives it that Winograndian tension, is quite often somebody's going, you know, what are you doing taking that picture of the blind man? Or, you know, what are you up to? It, it, it occur, occurs to me that we're like engaging in this like uh, ancient human endeavor of using always new technology to unpack and frame reality. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, there's a famous quote of Plato, like kind of decrying the alphabet as this technology, which is like making people, have you seen this? Like it, it making people not uh, have to remember things yeah. I, and that people won't actually know anything. And of mm -hmm. course then literature and philosophy is done with the written word and, uh, and, and that idea is considered kind of absurd at this point. Then photography, the same thing. Oh, it's just an easy way that, uh, you know, instead of painting, uh, but then someone comes along and, 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 and photographs and helps us, you know, uh, steer our eye towards reality in a new way. And then you, you're taking the written word again and applying it to that. And now we're using this completely new <laughs> technology and in providing, in a sense, a caption for the book, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so it's just like captioning and recaptioning and a, and a kind of a constant reinterpretation of reality, which is maybe what it is that we're doing here. Well, yeah. Right? And, <laughs> as humans. And, and of course, the and crucial, as artists. Yeah, and the crucial thing is that it's not just framing reality, the various photographic processes are, uh, are reconfiguring reality. You could even say creating reality, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, you know, what I'm struck by is the way that, you know, so now people of our age, my age particularly, you know, lament the way that, uh, you know, the kids, all they ever do is they don't really experience anything, they just photograph it, you know. Uh -huh. And it's really, so I, I make that lament about, you know, which I think of as a particular problem of sort of the iPhone era. But then you read Lawrence's wonderful, crazy essay, Art and Morality, which has absolutely nothing to do with art or morality, by the way, which he wrote shortly after he'd had his photograph taken by Edward Weston. You know, he laments the way that, unlike back in the days of ancient Egypt, when he says people just were, the ancient Egyptians had no... Try. Hold on. I want to, I want to get this thought. Ah. Just in case that is finished. Hold on. Just do this. One second. Just finish that thought. Tell me, uh, you were saying about Lawrence, wrote yeah. about the ancient Egyptians. Oh yeah, so he has this idea, which may or may not be, he uses the ancient Egyptians, the idea of them as these people who don't have a sort of conception of themselves. Really. Whereas he says now, since the invention of the Kodak, we all have this Kodak idea of, them, of ourselves. We're not ourselves anymore. We're just how the Kodak camera sees us. And basically what Lawrence is doing in that crazy, very prophetic essay is describing exactly the kind of syndrome that we associate with the iPhone era. So very often there's a prior history to our, our laments. We've always lived, in other words, in some kind of fallen world. Thank you, Jeff. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, great. I think this last one still worked. I haven't figured out exactly.